Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 648. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is February 23rd, 2021. Welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, our regular Tuesday edition. We sit down and we talk about the news from around the Anglican world, the Christian world, the secular world, the pagan world, the heathen world. You learn about it right here on Anglican Unscripted. Before we get too far, if you like this episode, and you will, you're going to like this episode. I want you to click the like button on both Facebook and YouTube. It helps promote the channel. If you're not subscribed yet, click that red rectangle. A little bell will pop up. You want to make that sure that bell is yellow. If it's a yellow bell, you're getting instant notifications of our show. Please go to the comment section and continue to comment. This is where the conversation continues. And, oh, this show's conversation is going to continue. I guarantee it. <laughs> For a long time um and then what else oh please please if you get an opportunity to share this program on facebook on twitter uh to your friends to your foes just click that link and share away we appreciate the free advertising that's that's how we don't have donations you donate for us your likes we appreciate it george how you doing this week very fine uh life is uh, progressing on it's really a wonderful life being a parish priest can't mm -hmm. get much better well it's florida life. too i mean life in florida as a parish priest you you know you you gotta be close to a golf course well you don't golf no i don't <laughs> oh, I, you, you're taking a different role as a tech priest than uh, some of those that i know okay good good i don't drink smoke <laughs> golf dance play cards chew tobacco or chase women I don't know why I'm an Episcopalian. Should have went Southern Baptist. Uh, early mistake in, in your education. That's fine. Um, got a lot of news to it's talk because about. because of my education that I'm an Episcopalian. <laughs> That's right. Um, a lot of news to talk about. Uh, a lot's happened. Uh, people, are, I'm still camped out here in Webster, Florida. We'll probably be leaving for our, our trip out of here in a month or two. Uh, we're, we're planning as we go. So that's the update on my location news a lot has happened since george and i spoke last uh, a lot of us happened on facebook and a lot of it is because the acna is now a mature organization uh, i remember early on in the early days of the acna uh, the need to keep a central location for all information if i had a question as a press person i had one person to talk to um, and I'd call and then they would check with three or four people to be sure the information they were giving me was right. Before I got a response from their media relations person, it had probably seen six or seven eyes top to, you know, from the top down. Are, is what we're saying to Kevin and Anglican TV and Anglican Inc. the right thing, the right message we want to send out? And that was then. This is now. <laughs> Now it's a little bit more mature. They're a little more freer with uh, um, who's allowed to speak for the ACNA, who has the logo on the website. And I think it bit them in the butt this week, George. And I think we should talk about amen, <laughs> of all things. Well, Ke Kevin, can we do the, get the good news out of the way first? Because it's really short. There's not much good news. But it, Well, it's great news. And people do complain that we don't give enough good news. George, we have the best story we could deliver for um, our friends in Fort Worth. Uh, let us know what it says, George. The uh, Fort Worth property cases are done. They're over. It's dead and final. The Supreme Court on Monday refused a writ of certiorari from the Episcopal Church in the cases disputing the ownership of the property, a uh, hundred million dollars worth of property, the newspapers say, uh, held by the, the churches of the Diocese of Fort Worth, led by Bishop Ryan Reed. The, uh, Kate, the court uh, was looking at three church property cases because you had the Texas cases where the Texas Supreme Court held that federal law mm -hmm. uh, tells us we have to follow neutral principles, meaning we look at the underlying documents. Whereas the Washington State uh, highest court uh, looked at a similar case involving a Presbyterian church in Seattle and said, well, 
yes, neutral principles would give them the property, the parish, but in Washington state, we interpret the federal law to say that we defer to the denomination. So you had two state Supreme Courts coming to opposite interpretations of the same underlying law. And so that would have been a natural Supreme Court case, but they kicked it down the road. Uh, no, they didn't kick it down the road. They, they said, just no, said, yeah. oh, we're not going to touch it. Yeah. So the Dennis Cannon, as Alan Haley says, is dead in Texas. It has no meaning whatsoever, uh, but the Dennis Cannon is alive in Washington State, uh, for instance. So, so for, for the people in Fort Worth, there's finality. There's no danger of their having their property pulled out from underneath them. And in fact, if the Episcopal, if the Diocese of Fort Worth wants to play hardball, they can now evict ten parishes that remain loyal to 815 and turn them over to the uh, loyalist remnant who remain loyal loyal to the Iker Diocese. I don't think that's in their plans because no. Bishop Iker long ago said, "If you want, you know, go your own way. Sure. We're, you know, we'll go our way, you go your way." But uh, believe me, if it had been the Episcopal Church, they wouldn't uh, wouldn't have given you that option. But over you know the last ten, twelve years in the, in this long, long, long court case. There's been victories on each side, little victories as, as they proceed up to the Supreme Court. Once we reported out, the Episcopal Church uh, won. They're now negotiating, you know, uh, who gets to stay and stuff like that. And then there was the, uh, the, the little wins in Dallas and stuff like that. Here we had the final say. The Supreme Court says, we're not going to hear this. We trust the Supreme Court of Texas to have handled this case well. And good, let's, let's go with that. I do think it can be resurrected, though. Uh, Alan says it was, uh, it's now dead, the Dennis Cannon in Texas. Well, they're trying to resurrect it in South Carolina, where it has been dead. Uh, the well, South Carolina said uh, years ago over um, Chuck Murphy's church, the Dennis Cannon does not apply here. The Episcopal Church is really trying to get it to apply there, there again, once again. Well, the problem is that there was a Supreme Court case in South Carolina, a state Supreme Court case, mm -hmm. that had a divided decision. Five decisions. So, <laughs> five decisions, and it's currently a mess. Mm -hmm. So the Episcopal Church claimed victory, but they, they didn't have victory. In other words, it was uh, the state Supreme Court screwed up. Uh, and it, it has to go through the the mill once again mm -hmm. and more likely than not the the lawrence diocese of south carolina will prevail mm -hmm. um based on all that has gone before but yeah, it's just judicial incompetence in south carolina i mean I, I, and i'm not saying this because i would have preferred one outcome versus another but when you have a court that gives five separate when you give a court that has no one binding opinion on what a ruling means you basically have wasted everybody's time yeah and that's something that should be decided by the supreme court then uh if the the state court can't do it but uh that'll be another discussion with alan haley uh at a future date when uh, more news comes out of south carolina uh back to the news of the weekend and the news of the week so far uh we alluded to some stories that have appeared on facebook and I talked a little bit about the early days of the ACNA. The day now the ACNA is matured, and they're not so overly, uh, uh, what's the right word? They are concerned, but they, they don't jot and tittle everything to death when it's going out the, the press door. And lots of people are allowed to speak for the ACNA. So much so that that kind of bit them in the butt. And I want to talk a little bit uh, about amen and kind of the need for more centralized control of the message coming out of the ACNA, George. Well, that's one argument. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, what's happening? Lawrence Macarath, who is the uh, director of the Anglican Multi-Ethnic Network, which is an official charted network of the Anglican Church in North America, was called to active duty by the army, and he's over in if, Afghanistan, I think. And so they brought in an interim director for AMEN. Now, 
On Facebook, a number of social media posts have pointed out the person, Joanna Marie Williams, uh, prior Facebook posts. And one web, one group that I monitor and belong to notes that on her personal Facebook page, the new Amen interim director believes one, her mission is to show how the Jesus is, to show how who Jesus is answers womenist, post-humanist, and Afro-pessimistic ontological concerns, and to show a deeper commitment to Jesus Christ, the Bible and the church can and should legitimately lead to a deeper commitment to fighting the capitalist, imperialist, racist, hetero patriarchy. Does she live in Cuba? Uh, <laughs> this is just wonderful <laughs> stuff for news reporters. Now, Joanna Marie Williams has a perfect right to believe whatever she wants, and she is a lay theologian mm -hmm. uh, based in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. And I've not read any of her works. I've not seen how her thought uh, meshes with the doctrine and discipline of the Anglican Church in North America, but from a buzzword perspective, from she the words that are designed, <laughs> from the words that are designed that cause people to have hysteria. This could be from the Episcopal Divinity School or Union Theological Center. This is from the far left of the Episcopal uh, Protestant world. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite a surprise to, for some people. And the reason why is that this is not just somebody, well, this is somebody's own personal little idiosyncrasies. There's been some concern that's been voiced repeatedly about the hold that critical race theory has on a certain section of the Anglican Church in North America. There's a uh, full-blown critical race theory, which you hear from people like Ibrahim Kendi, where white people are, which is basically repackaged Louis Farrakhan, that white people are devils, we're the ice people, and all this mm -hmm. and that. Then you have mild critical race theory that we have to deal with, and you see white liberals in the ACNA spout this, that we have to deal with our white privilege and our white and our white nationalism. We have to be less white, George. Yes, and, and that somehow in the amniotic fluid of my mother, I was somehow past not only the original sin of Adam, but the original sin of being a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. and, and the original, you were a slave owner because you were white. Uh, that was passed through your DNA. Um, you're oppressive because you're white, you're a colonialist, a, a colonizer, you're an imperialist, yeah, all because of your skin color. And I know what I'm saying is racist, unless it's not. <laughs> and that and that my being white, I just can't understand the black experience, um, that there's something non, uh, that only, so, that knowledge is experiential mm -hmm. based on genetics. It's not uh, independent of the person which is all utter and complete nonsense. It's, in other words, uh, I do morning and evening prayer every day and I read all the, these. The, I read the Psalms every day and I read the, uh, the hymns to Christ. And what is repeated again and again and again is that in Christ there is no tribe, there is no class, there is no race, there are no black Christians and gay Christians and white Christians or Jewish Christians or Greek Christians, they're only Christians, right? And we, we talked about this two or three weeks ago. To hyphenate is heresy. Mm -hmm. When you add a hyphen to Christian, you have created heresy. And so this is the backdrop to all of this that we're getting some people with the ACNA logo across their forehead, offering to the public a theology that is pretty darn well. It's pretty silly. Uh, it's it's not what I would consider to be a uh, manifestation of traditional Christian teaching, and it's certainly not Anglican. Mm -hmm. If by Anglican you mean uh, being tied to the tradition and formularies and doctrine and discipline of the Anglican way. So this is the background. Now you've got a new person who's responsible for an agency, the ACNA, with every single buzzword that Union Theological Seminary would... Uh, 
wish you to adopt. No, they, they're jealous. We never thought of this. <laughs> we need to start teaching this here. And, you know, that's kind of the, the reality when things get a, a, a little out of hand. And um, we reported the good, the good story, the Texas story. The, the Diocese of Fort Worth has won in court once and for all. One step forward. Two steps back are uh, the Amen Network, and now this uh, uh, dear. Well, Kevin, yeah? we we've, we've been in touch with people. What I'll let you say. What's going to happen with all this? Is this just a fait accompli? This is a, a little tech colony in Acna. I mean, is it well, we've stand? been in touch with people. I mean, if there's been one example of the ACNA. Uh, that shines compared to the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion, it's built in accountability. When things go awry, somebody gets the phone call. And it, the mess gets fixed, somebody gets deposed, somebody uh, uh, finds another job somewhere else, somebody's let go. There is really good built-in accountability within the ACNA that I've never seen in any uh, Christian structure since maybe... <clears throat> the book of acts but you know aside from that you know we're to the point now where this is embarrassing and i think the acna is embarrassed when stuff like this appears the person we talked to about this says yeah the logo got away from us you know and we, we, you know, we are going to get that logo back and i understand that kevin so you're DNA should be more like Walt Disney Corporation and that you just can't put Mickey Mouse on any old no. you've got to buy a license and you've got to be pre-approved uh -huh. by uh, Orlando well I mean a person with the, the pedigree of uh, titles and desires and acronyms uh, and adjectives that we read from in the Amen Network probably can't sign on to the Jerusalem Declaration Probably can't sign on to the 39 articles. Probably can't sign on to the bylaws and stuff of the ACNA. So how is that working? I, it, there's there's got to be a point where you're able to, I agree with the ACNA on these things. And but well, I'll, I'll, let me speak in defense. I'm, I'm being okay. contrarian today. Yeah, well, what's going on? I think that, uh, that the person, uh, that there are people who are in the ACNA and firmly believe in its the Jerusalem Declaration and the Doctrine and the District, but but who would describe himself as uh, uh, womanist, post-humanist, Afro-pessimistic ontological ontologists who are concerned with fighting capitalist, imperialist, racist, heteropatriarchal structures? Because we have different understandings and definitions of words, and see, here's the job for the bishops. The bishops uh, need to. I would I would offer that the if if each of us can define what words mean, words mean nothing, yeah. and that's been the and that's as you pointed out, Kevin, the problem of the Episcopal Church. In my diocese, uh, you know, good conduct of a clergyman means if I called Orlando and said I'm leaving my wife to marry my secretary, the bishop would say, "Well, I think you should pursue your vocation as a taxi driver." We don't have divorced and remarried. In, in other words, that's that's grounds in your, in your diocese. In my you, diocese, you, right? I went to school with a girl. Uh, she's a woman, excuse me, uh, who's been married five times, wow. and she's a priest in good standing in the diocese of Iowa. Um, hmm. That's not possible. But so we have what moral, you know, the definitions in the Episcopal Church change by zip code. And if the ACNA is happy with that, well, then that's that's fine for them. But they need I would I would recommend that the bishops be a little more active in saying how these terms we understand them, so that when you repeat them, you understand that you're saying something that is not necessarily means what you think it means. Okay, well, that led to the fire, because the House of Bishops clearly, distinctly said exactly their thoughts on same-sex attraction in a letter uh, put out three weeks, four weeks ago. Well-written, well-defined, terms easily defined. This is what this means. This is how we will uh, uh, attach identity to these things. And that started a fire, George, uh, that is trying to be put out today. 
Well, it started a fire at the very top when you had one bishop rank ranks hmm. and offer... Okay, I'm offering my opinion. The bishop didn't doesn't know what it means to be Anglican. He doesn't understand what it means to be a bishop. He doesn't understand uh, his job is uh, to drive away a false and extraneous, extraneous doctrine, not By, to and, be, and, or add to it. Yes, yeah, or or adds. He should not be on a journey. He should have arrived, uh, and so this bishop broke the ranks, which then in turn allowed others who don't have positions of responsibility and authority to say, I don't like this, I don't like that, and I'm going to interpret in my way. And so when the bishop said, you know, what our statement from was not uh, uh, ex cathedra, it basically was advice and counsel on how we urge you to act, you're free to ignore it. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think that's what the bishops meant to say. I, I think bishops meant to say you're free to think about this, but we have spoken. It's done. Uh, this is where we are. This is our voice. And so I, I, I start at the top. So mm -hmm. in one of these, so there was that letter to the Diocese of uh, C4SO, which was problematic. And I really would urge the bishops, if they want to be taken seriously uh, as an Anglican entity, to get their act together. I can say the same about the Episcopal Church, so don't hear me picking on any <laughs> in particular. But this then led to people farther down the totem pole, as I said, pointing out flaws that they saw. And this past week, we saw published a letter called Dear Gay Anglicans. And if you think the something hit the fan with a man, it really, really blew up. So, Kevin, tell us about Dear Gay Anglican. Well, I, the, the uh, it's really hard to, to, to formulate because there's two sides of the frame of what it means to be... Uh, either same-sex attracted or same-sex afflicted. Some people with same-sex attraction believe they have an affliction uh, and uh, look at it that way. Some people with same-sex attraction look at it as, as a, this is the way I am and I'll never change and uh, I will go forward in that. And as such, we have, I guess they call themselves side B uh, uh, gay Christians, and then there's those who fully embrace the attraction and the lifestyle. Where does the church, you know, put the, where does scripture, the church, put the line in all this? And the line is according to scripture, we are transformed, we are new creatures. All that was be behind us is shed away. In Christ. Okay. Greedy Kevin, as a Christian, is no longer greedy. What I lust for as before Christian, I should not be lusting for as a Christian. In theory, and in practice, and through prayer and scripture and meditation, it works for Kevin. I'm not greedy like I used to be. I've shed that away. How do we interpret that to people where we're trying to minister to uh, those in this very secular, very pagan world who believe there is nothing wrong with same-sex attraction? That there's nothing wrong with uh, living with somebody? Where there's nothing wrong with the, the Tinder culture, the, the one-night stands? When there's nothing wrong with what I need to do to make myself feel good. And there's nothing wrong with pride. And there's nothing wrong with all these things that are contrary to scripture. So here we have the House of the, the College of Bishops, the ACNA, put together a, we hear that you guys are, are confused about what's going on in culture and what's going on in the church. Let us put together a sound doctrine on same-sex attraction and sexual identity, which they did. We still have those people who are out there ministering and saying, I don't like the words you're using. I don't, I don't agree with those words. 
let me try and put those words in a different package and have people sign on to what I say more than what you say. And so we had a letter called uh, Dear Gay Anglican that was published this week by uh, a guy, Peter Volk. Uh, I do not know him. I've, in fact, I've not heard of his ministry uh, until a week or two ago where he put together how he defines or his organization defines some of these words. And that's where the controversy is, as we talked about just moments ago. What do words mean? Within the context of the ACNA, it, if it is to be taken at face value that it's a big tent, then mm -hmm. Peter Valk has a right to put forward his points of view. And if it were just Peter Valk, this would not be an issue. Mm -hmm. But when you have three members of the faculty of Trinity Seminary, as co-authors, the original authors. Sign were, were the signers or co-authors? Co-authors. They're okay. in the top box. Okay, top they're box. They're in the top, yeah. top boxes. Why are we sure we identify they're not, this correctly? They're not, <laughs> they're not people who signed on after the fact. They're hmm. people in the in the first paragraph. Um, I, I spoke with Peter Valk, and I admire his courage and admire and honesty. His understanding of the bishop's letter was that it was lacking as a tool in order to reach agnostics, people who are not Christian, who uh, experience same-sex attraction. What Peter Valk wanted to do was to say, we believe in traditional sexual ethic, and but into our life and into our faith and into our community, come, there's a path and a place for you here. So the intention was not to overturn the church's teachings. It was not to contradict the bishops. It was to approach an audience for whom the bishop's letter was not written. It was to approach an audience of gay agnostics and say, we're here, we love you, uh, we stand for what the church has always taught, but we see a place for you in this community. Context is key. It yes, depends it when you say a statement, because in the life, the end, so if it's just Peter Valk saying this, young guy in his 20s, okay, that's fine. But when you have establishment figures, seminary professors at this, Trinity Seminary was founded by uh, uh, Peter, Bishop Paul Rogers, Roger. yeah. uh, John Rogers, mm -hmm. After, who left Virginia Seminary because Virginia Seminary had tenure and they couldn't get rid of heretical professors. The kooks. Se the kooks. <laughs> Once you had tenure, you could be kooked the rest of your life. Trinity Seminary doesn't have tenure, and it, it was deliberately doesn't have tenure so that if somebody went around the bend, they could get rid of them. So Trinity Seminary has always prided itself on being that bastion of ever-renewing orthodoxy. And to have three of their professors, including a, a retired bishop, signed this letter in the context of where everybody's been over the past 20 years of having to deal with an Episcopal church that is leading the fight against capitalist, imperialist, racist, heteropatriarchal structures, that just caused people to blow a gasket. Uh, and re read, and so though, so the vast majority of ACNA clergy, I would, have, I would postulate, certainly those who came out of the Episcopal church, would read this as an attack on their very identity. That it, what they what they stood and fought for and what they lost property and pensions and their careers were ruined in a normal way, that's all now brought been brought inside and is being championed by the people who should be teaching us not to be this way, the professors and leaders of the church. Well, there, and there's truth to that, because if you're reading this and you were deposed by the Episcopal Church and you had to join the, the ACNA, you have a bit of PTSD in this. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, every time you, you see a floating letter out there, like that says, Dear Gay Anglican, you're like, what on earth? What a... What, we, we, we just left this. It's like my husband returning to beat me. And so you're sitting here and you're going to react. You're going to react on Facebook, and uh, you, which we saw, by the way. Um, and I have a little bit of sympathy for Peter because I know what he was trying to do. Because I was that young 
passionate, idealist little guy uh, a couple years ago now uh who would just you know get the team together yeah we're gonna go 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 uh and uh i i I made many mistakes at that age as well and i think this was just ill-timed and when i read it i'm reading into it the fallacy uh, there's a fallacy called category and this letter is repeat with it um and you really need to sit back and know that in the context of what the ACNA College of Bishops did, wrote a fine statement, you let that play a little longer. And then you have the ACNA bishops endorse and sign on to this further uh, contextual into ministry of the agnostic uh, gaze. We offer this. uh, So... So now we're the fire's still going, George. If you look well, on Facebook right now, the, but there are many valid points that they raise. Yes. but they were just not well put. I, for one, am a firm believer that fornication for a heterosexual is the same category Equal. of sin as fornication for a homosexual person. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I don't like using those terms. Um, I, I was brought up. I, I went to college. I joined. I was in a fraternity. I was an athlete in sports and all this and that. Yet I was told from a very young age that you do not have sex until you're married. I didn't grow up in the Victorian. I grew up in the modern era, and I was a minority in that world. Mm-hmm. So here I am in my late fifties, and I've only ever known one woman in my life. That's my wife for the past thirty-five years, and that. I'm saying was what I was taught was what should be. Now people fall short. Most people do. Mm -hmm. I'm not holding myself up. Uh, I've certainly, if I had the opportunity when I was 19 years old, I would have done plenty of stupid things. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'd. But but the point is that when when we make the assumption that it's all right for heterosexuals, it's all right for my daughter to move in with her boyfriend that's somehow okay but it's terrible if my son moved in with his boyfriend that's wrong it's equally bad no lust is bad no matter what your attraction okay it clearly uh, identified uh in scripture that uh but in the same way we do not identify ourselves by what we lust for and and so I agree, but yet I disagree with. The, I'm as as I've mentioned many times in this show. I'm a great believer in personal autonomy. I'm a, I'm an American. I live on the frontier, so to speak. Uh, you know, when I when you know, twenty five years ago, where I'm sitting right now in my parish office, this was all cattle fields and swamps. We're on still on the frontier here in Florida. Mm-hmm. You certainly are more of the frontier, I, Kevin, down yeah. in Webster. <laughs> sure. I think that's a, a, there's a turtle going across the street right now. Yeah, of course. But the, the point being is that you can have personal autonomy only if you recognize a higher or greater authority. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise your personal autonomy is meaningless in a world that has no meaning. And so my autonomy is restricted and circumscribed by the, auto- by the authority of right and wrong as stated in scripture. On Sunday, I recited the Decalogue, first Sunday in Lent. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, and so on and so forth. Um, These are non-negotiables. These are non-interpretable things. It's not okay. It's not okay to steal because you're hungry. It's not okay to murder because it's convenient um, for you, or it gets rid of a problem. my but but my point is that the modern fallacy that Frank Griswold was the most noted for of the pluriformity of truths. I remember him clearly saying at the primates meeting in two thousand three in London that what you know he was defending the appointment of Gene Robinson as Bishop of New Hampshire. He said to the bishops there, "Well, what's right for you in Nigeria is different from what is right for us in New York." I don't believe that. I believe in universals. Thank God, because Biden believes that China can enslave a million uh, Muslims 
because that's what's right for China to keep that uh, synchronicity they have sin oh boy and so yeah, yeah they're right it, it, uh, we live in a rural uh, a world created with borders and boundaries and one of those boundaries in creation uh, clearly was the creation of man and woman for a purpose and so and kevin you and i live in midlife crisis central which is florida uh and you know it's not uncommon to have people in my congregation uh it's not common but it's not uncommon to say i'm leaving my wife buying a motorcycle and taking off for the great unknown well friends that's wrong you know it's wrong to do that and there's no right way there's no right reason uh, to leave your wife if you're lusting after a younger woman. Mm. It's, see, we're not the gospel of Frank Sinatra. I've got to be me. I've got to be free. i got to do it my way. We have to do it Christ's way. And part of my un discomfort with this whole c gay conversation is that Christ's way is pretty well laid out. I don't see how we're going to re rediscover what Jesus was thinking what Paul was thinking 2,000 years after the fact when the church has had 2,000 years to basically nail it pretty much down tight. And, and they have. I mean, the, the three things we have, experience, tradition, reason. Uh, uh, scripture, tradition, scripture, and reason. Uh, <laughs> it's you the know. fourth thing that people want to add, but we stick with the first three. Yeah. And it's scripture is the thickest leg of mm -hmm. those school it's the tradition and reason make sure the school doesn't tip over but right. scripture uh -huh. now this is an evangelical talking scripture yeah. <laughs> is the center yes it they're is. not three equal legs well they're not but never on, on any one topic has experience tradition and reason and scripture agreed okay on sexuality and broken sexuality uh, those three muses agree entirely uh, uh, on the wrongness of uh, lusting outside the bounds of man, woman, marriage. So, uh, unequivocally, <sighs> nations have fallen because of it. So, I mean, it, it's a tough topic. I know it's a tough topic because it divided the Episcopal Church. Um, I know it's a tough topic because it's it's tearing at the fabric of the Anglican Communion, but I would say that you need to be more careful when you want to uh, communicate in the bounds of uh, distributed authority. Above you is a bishop, above you is an archbishop, and uh, let's try and keep the message clean and consistent and agree on the words. There was nothing wrong with the words and definitions in the statement from the, the College of Bishops. and. Uh, if you want to further that conversation, you use the College of Bishops to further that message because they came out with an incredibly strong, momentous statement that was heard around the world. Okay, GAFCON had this wonderful message coming from the ACNA College of Bishops about sexual identity and dealing with same-sex attraction and how the church is going to, to, to define it. And now we're we're having a little forest fire going on here. So, if I could put on a Congarian interpretation, not Eve Congar, no, I was gonna say French, the Roman Catholic theologian, but yes. George Conger, <laughs> Conger. Uh, <laughs> is that you cut people slack, you take them at their face value, you listen to them, and, and understand them with the light of. Uh, love and Christ and try to seek and find the good in what they're saying that's how you should and so friends do not att I would urge you do not attack the Amen director do not attack Peter Volk for disagreeing with you engage with their arguments treat the person with love and dignity and respect absolutely but yeah. don't cut the bishops any slack <laughs> no, because, no, bishops, no seriously no, no absolutely the Congaria principle <laughs> When you when you when you sign on as a bishop, you lose the right to be wrong. You lose the right to be careless in your language. You lose you, the right to say you're on a journey yeah. anymore. You don't get to say you're on a journey. You have arrived. 
you're there, uh, and the Bible, in the New Testament is very explicit about the role of a bishop. And, and see, that, that's, but that's, I wish the ACNA and I wish the Anglican way would do what the Vatican did at Vatican II and state what a bishop is. Yeah. Because the bishop, the episcopacy is one of the major failings of the Episcopal Church in the 20th century. It's the major failing of the Church of England in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And if this is the path the ACNA is going down, it's going to be their major feeling too. Yeah. Of uh, bishops going bonkers. I and I agree. However, the, the one experience I've had with the ACNA is accountability, and so I, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the the fires and, and how the fires make you look bad. Um, I, we'll see what happens. You know, I I in like I said, I understand where Peter's coming from. I, I was I was I was that guy a long time ago, you know, and I I was on a mission, <laughs> so you know I understand and you know this this too. Here I'm going to go back to something that happened when I ran a blog called Connecticut Six, uh, maybe 12 years ago, 13 years ago. I made a mistake, an error. I published a story that was wrong. It made a lot of people look bad, including myself. I remember talking to Kendall Harmon. I said, "What do I do? Do I issue corrections? What do I do? I, you know, sackcloth. What what do I do?" He said, "Kevin, the number one thing you need to know is that the internet is self-correcting. You know, it, it, you <laughs> if you're wrong, you will know. You will say you're sorry, and you will move on." Now, uh, this may be a, a wonderful example of that. Um, George, it's uh, we. how long have we gone here? 41 minutes. Most patient audience in the world, if you made it this far. I had to turn the AC on because I went 40 minutes here with nice and quiet, but now we're going to... Uh, the tin can heated up in that time here in Florida. Um, that's it. Anything else you want to talk about, George? No, not Indian corruption. What do I got to say? <laughs> yeah, no, geez. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 648 of Anglican Unscripted.